Thank you, Professor Kriesi. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, during uh, these days, uh, you have heard uh, and discussed a lot on democracy and uh, its challenges in our times. That is why I would like to start off with federalism and then a focus on the complex relation between democracy and federalism. Federalism as a political idea refers to a system which combines diversity and unity. Federal states are characterized by the division of public tasks between two levels of government, the central government and the regional government. Each government has its own sovereign responsibilities and is directly liable to the citizens. The member states are autonomous in their fields of jurisdiction. They have their own legislative, executive and judicial authorities and shall participate in the decision-making processes of the central government. The combination of self-rule and shared rule characterizes federal states and offers different population groups the possibility to live their political, cultural or religious diversities in unity. Especially in today's times of globalization, the combination of state unity and member state plurality seems to be a widespread wish of the populations. Many of them want to be global consumers and local self-determining citizens at the same time. Federalism allows minorities in multicultural states to preserve their own cultural identity without having to refrain from the size advantages of central states, for example, common market, common defense, and so on. Out of the 192 member states of the UN, however, only 25, about 25 are federal states today in the sense that their constitutions stipulate the division of state responsibilities between the central state and its constituent units, the direct applicability of the legal orders to their citizens, and the right of the member states to participate in the decision-making process of the central state. That is a normal, at least for lawyers, the normal definition of a federal state. Yet about 40% of the world's population lives in federal states. The reason for this is that especially large and highly populated states such as India, USA, Brazil, Pakistan, Russia, Nigeria, Mexico, and Germany are federal states in the sense we have just mentioned. The importance, the practical importance of federalism can not be overestimated in today's world. Federalism has virtually spread in three large cycles. The first federal states were founded at the end of the 18th and during the 19th century, USA, Switzerland, Canada, and Australia. They were already in the 19th century joined by some Latin American states, Mexico, Argentina, and Brazil. Uh, of course, uh, we could and might discuss on the federal substance of those Latin American states, especially at those times. A second wave of newly established federal states occurred after the World War II, when colonial empires in India, in Pakistan, and Nigeria ended and nationalism in Europe was overcome with Yugoslavia against the Federal Republic of Germany and the start of the European integration with the European Coal and Steel Community and the EC. In recent time, and that's the third wave, Formerly centrally organized unitary states, such as Belgium, Spain, or South Africa, adopted or practiced federalist forms of government, either explicitly or de facto. In many conflict areas of the world, such as Bosnia-Herzegovina, Iraq, or Nepal, 
new federations arose. With the Treaty of Lisbon, the federal features of the European Union, majority decisions, extended parliamentary competences, and so on, were strengthened. Of course, the European Union uh, still remains a hybrid international organization which combines federal and confederal uh, features. In federal states like Germany or Switzerland, important reforms have been uh, realized regarding federalism. I cannot enter in detail, but in Germany the most important uh, change of the Grundgesetz was a federal reform, and in Switzerland we have reinforced federalism with the new constitution, and especially with the new equalization, uh, uh, financial equalization system that was accepted in 2004 and entered in, two for, two in force two years ago. In view of these developments, I think it's definitely correct to talk about the real renaissance of federalism in our times. However, critical voices have always been raised. I remember when I was at the law school in Berkeley, one colleague, a constitutionalist, told me, oh, you see, federalism, it's a chameleon-like concept. That means all things to all men and can be easily used and abused for any political purposes. Often uh, federalism is too blamed for being complicated and slow in decision-making processes. In short, little efficient. However, it might be difficult to demonstrate it if we take into account that almost all international global competitiveness rankings are headed by federal states, such as US, Canada, Germany, Switzerland, and those federations are within the most stable states in the world. Federalism has again become attractive in today's world due to a wide range of reasons. On the one hand, the development is related to obvious failures of performance of highly centralized states. Keywords are bureaucratization, centralization of power in government and administration, abuse of power, remoteness of decision makers, lack of flexibility and adaptation to different conditions within a country, and so on. On the other hand, federalism is regarded as positive to, uh, due to its enhanced possibility to control state power, allocation of public services according to preferences by the citizens, coexistence of different regional identities in the unity of the federal state, and last but not least, by more and better participation of citizens, in short, more and better democracy. But is it really true that federalism leads to more and better democracy? You might have become aware of the fact that federalism does neither establish nor guarantee democracy. When you heard the names of some federalist countries as Nigeria, Pakistan or Russia, and indeed, if we take a glance at the democracy index compiled by the well-known newspaper The Economist, it shows the following picture. Eight federal states are considered to be full of functioning democracies. In the following order, and here we have a, a bit of difference with uh, Professor Merkel, Switzerland, Australia, Canada, Germany, Austria, Spain, and U USA and Belgium. Five countries are listed as flawed democracies in the following order, South Africa, India, Brazil, Mexico, and Argentina. Six countries are stated as hybrid regimes in the following order, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Venezuela, Ethiop Ethiopia, Russia, and Pakistan. And three countries appear as authoritarian regimes, Nigeria, as the Comoros, and the United Arab Emirates. 
it is clear that federations themselves, just as centralized states, are not able to guarantee democracy. And we can meaningfully ask ourselves whether authoritarian regimes might be considered as federal states just because they have formally a federal constitution. As early as in 1956, a famous federalist writer Livingstone wrote, I quote, federal government is suitable only to those polities that are organized upon a democratic or a Republican foundation. By this is meant merely that it is incompatible with any form of dictatorship or absolutism. Federal government presupposes a desire and an ability to secure the component units against encroachment by the central government. And this is definitely not the case of authoritarian regimes. Literature, in the literature, however, mainly refers to the external forms of federations, knowing well that the external form and federal substance often differ quite a lot. Finally, it seems to me it is a problem of definition to name federations all states that have a federal constitution or only those that practice federal government. How good is now the performance of federal states when it comes to democracy compared with non-federal states? The well-known American federalism expert John Kincaid investigated this issue in a very new study in depth. He came on, plenty, on the basis of plenty of statistical data to the following conclusions. Although on average the world's federal polities perform only slightly better than the world's non-federal polities on mere electoric, electoral uh, uh, democracy, but they score substantially better on protection of political rights and civil liberties, and especially on quality of life. And Kincaid deliberately included to this examination the so-called authoritarian federations in his analysis in order to not influence the picture in favor of the federal state. Despite the obvious violation of the simple majority rule, his theoretical conclusion is also rather surprising. I quote, federal democracy is more democratic than non-federal democracy. He based his conclusions mainly on two deliberations. Federal democracy asks from national decision making to be more consensual than majoritarian. Furthermore, a federal democracy vastly uh, increases opportunities for participation by multiplying the number of participatory forms and by making more elected offices and governments accessible to ordinary citizens. I think this shows the dependence of such conclusions on how democracy is defined only as electoral democracy or as John Kincaid does it, as a liberal or even a consensus-oriented democracy. But uh, let us leave global analysis behind and stick to our own experience. And here I would like to make use of a very common distinction in federal literature between demos enabling and demos constraining features. In Switzerland, citizens have the possibility to elect the members of the national parliament on the central level every four years. On a cantonal level, they elect the members of their parliament, of their government, and sometimes even of the courts in different time lags. For example, in my tiny canton, we are doing it each year on the occasion of the Landsgemeinde. On the federal level, 
The Swiss people participated in the last 20 years in uh, 197 votes. That is about 10 per year. In addition to this, we had in my home canton about 10 votes each year on the cantonal level. Of course, this frequency of votes is related to the direct democracy on the federal and on the cantonal level. But even if we imagine Switzerland to be a centralized uh, unitary state, horribly dictu, as a republic only indivisible as in times of the Helvetic uh, Republic, uh, five years after you know, under French command, the citizens would considerably lose their voice opportunities. On the one hand, the election of cantonal authorities would disappear, and on the other hand, uh, there would be much fewer votes in a unitary centralized system. Because on the cantonal level, we vote a lot on credits, on building legislation, schools, hotels, hunting, and so on. It would be just not possible to do it on the central uh, uh, federal level. The findings are clear. The Swiss federal state offers its citizens significant more opportunities to participate in elections and votes than they would have if Switzerland would be a centralized country with direct democracy. It makes it possible to better meet people's preferences, to find better solutions for different problems, and to elect authorities who are closer to the people. And furthermore, it is easier to follow the fiscal equivalence principle that is a necessary congruence between decision makers, users, and cost bearers of public services. According to empirical studies, this led to a more cost-conscious spending of public funds in Switzerland and has significantly contributed to the country's health public finances compared uh, with other countries. And finally, the vertical division of power uh, between the federal government and the cantons increases the control of political power. A glance back into Switzerland's history shows how federalism and democracy, and democracy have influenced, supported, and complemented each other. Switzerland's direct democracy has its origins in the Landsgemeinde, this annual meeting of the citizens of a canton to elect their authorities and pass the cantonal laws. A democratic institution which was held in several cantons since the Middle Ages. Now it's still only in two cantons. When Napoleon, as first consul of France, welcomed the delegates of the Helvetic Disputation in Paris in the year 1803, after the Helvetic Republic failed under French command, he made a very interesting distinction. He spoke of canton démocratique et canton aristocratique, and explained, I quote, ce sont les cantons démocratiques, ce sont leurs formes de gouvernement qui vous distinguent dans le monde et qui vous rendent intéressant aux yeux de l'Europe. Sans ces démocraties, vous ne présenteriez rien que ce que l'on trouve ailleurs. Vous n'auriez pas de couleur particulière. And exactly because of the many diversities between the Swiss cantons in respect to democracy, religion, and language, he, he concluded, je n'ai jamais cru un moment que vous puissiez avoir une république une et indivisible. La Suisse a été intéressante aux yeux de l'Europe comme État fédératif. Elle pourra le redevenir comme tel. Et puis on lui attribue aussi cette phrase « La Suisse est fédérative ou elle n'est pas ». Later on, no other than the former aristocratic cantons such as Zurich adopted new democratic constitutions and pushed towards the transformation of the old confederation into a modern federal state. 
a more recent example of how federalization and democratization support and complement each other is the development of Swiss foreign policy during the last few years. In the Swiss federal state, foreign policy was for a long time uh, also reserved to the central government. It means to the federal council and uh, especially the federal department of foreign affairs. The parliament only had the competence to approve international treaties. Then as light as the 20th century, the people were granted referendum rights for international tre treaties and with the exception of border traffic, the cantons did not have any authority in the field of foreign policy. With the new federal constitution, the cantons and parliament received significant rights to participate in foreign policy. The cantons are explicitly granted rights to participate in the shaping of our foreign policy in form of information and consultation rights. In those areas where cantons are respons responsible, their statements shall have special weight and they shall participate in international or negotiations in an appropriate way. The Parliament explicitly received the right to shape foreign policy in Article 166. One might now uh, argue that by the participation of the cantons in decisions of foreign policy, negotiations became too complicated. But both measures have led to a significant opening and better acceptance of foreign policy among the people and the cantons. And here in my old age, I have really very interesting experiences. When I entered parliament in 71, I think it was, everybody wanted to go to the military committee. That was the most attractive. Now everybody wants to go to the foreign policy committee. And when I was a student, uh, some professor would even uh, say the best foreign, foreign policy for Switzerland is none. All these attributes are clearly demos enabling features of federalism. They strengthen democracy in our federal uh, state and make democracy possible, not only on the central government, but also in the 26 cantons. Now to the demos constraining features. As in all uh, other federal states, there are also uh, demos constraining features in Switzerland. Critics see the main source of annoyance regarding federalism in the violation of the one man on one vote rule. In fact, in order to reach the majority of the cantons, which besides the majority of the people is necessary for changing our constitution, a person from the canton of Uri, a nearby a tiny canton, counts 39 times more than a person from the canton of Zurich. Federalism is said to be inherently antithetical to the pure majority rule. By limiting the majority rule, federalism violates, of course, the basic principles of majoritarian democracy. Another de demos constraining feature of federalism is usually seen in our bicameral system of parliament. So protective function towards smaller constituent units regularly assigned to the second federal parliamentary chamber also leads to a reduction of the principle of democracy. This is especially the case in the US and in Switzerland where both parliamentary chambers have equal rights in the legislation process. For the election of their, and I, I, of course I'm coming, as Professor Chris mentioned it, from a very tiny canton when I was in Berkeley, of course, I was very interested, uh, I was very surprised to see that the difference in the US is still greater than in Switzerland. Uh, because uh, in, uh, for the election, for example, of the two senators uh, in, 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 in the US, a citizen from Wyoming 
has uh, 65% more voting power than the citizen of California. Such uh, demos constraining features can be found in all federal countries in various intensities. In, uh, uh, another example to illustrate it, I would like to mention here is the electoral college system in US presidential elections. As you may remember, due to this system, George W. Bush was elected president in the year 2000, despite the fact that Al Gore received more votes but less electors. In many federal states, especially the so-called executive federalism and intergovernmental relations related to it have been criticized for being anti-democratic. It seems to give rise to stronger governments at the cost of parliament and in direct democracy also at the cost of the people. In Switzerland, in particularly intercantonal concordats, how we, how we name them, meets with criticism. They were negotiated unilaterally by the cantonal governments, the people's representatives, and at best the people had only the right to accept or deny intercantonal treaties and referendums, but they couldn't influence their content. However, there is an increasing demand for horizontal agreements in many fields of cantonal com competence in our small country, for example, in education, in health, health services, in, in police, and so on. Cantons are faced with the dilemma that they will have to harmonize the law through intercantonal treaties in their fields of jurisdiction. If not, there may be an increased centralization by the federal government. Within the new reorganization of financial equalization, it has even become possible for the federal uh, government to, to declare, and I think that's unique in the world, to declare intercantonal agreements as generally binding on the request of interested canton. This may happen in nine uh, areas, for example, of cantonal uh, jurisprudence, uh, jurisdictions such as cantonal universities, suburban transport, high-end medicine, and so on. However, this new stipulation has not yet been applied, but it's a, a bit a Damocles schwert uh, on, uh, for the cantons to harmonize or the result will be centralization. In the meantime, a counter movement has started in the area of executive federal, federalism in various cantons. Cantonal legislature are granted information and uh, consultation rights in negotiations of international treaties similar to those on the federal level. In recent times, even political scientists begin to see horizontal federalism, which has often been criticized by uh, political scientists as very negative, as a chance to further develop the traditionally very introverted demo democracy in Switzerland. They would argue in today's world, uh, which is increasingly uh, characterized by cross-border interdependencies and mobility, the inclusion of the other, it's meant to other cantons or on the, on the level of the Swiss government of other states might offer a possibility to practice a broader legitimate understanding of democracy in intercantonal and international cities. I come to the conclusion. With his comparative global analysis, of the relation between federalism and democracy, John Kincaid deducted the following conclusion. Empirically, federal polities compare well with non-federal systems on democracy and rights protection, but much better on quality of life. Theoretically, moreover, federal democracy is more democratic than non-federal democracy. In view of the obvious deficits of democracy in certain federal states and the noted criticism towards the violation of the one-man-on-vote rule, 
as well as the executive federalism as these conclusions might uh, seem to be very positive towards federalism and are related, as we have seen, to his liberal, consensus-oriented, not majoritarian understanding of a democracy. But they mostly correspond to our own experience. Federalism might not be able to establish nor guarantee democracy in a country. And depending on the understanding of democracy, there are stronger or weaker tensions between federalism and democracy. However, the, main, the many demos enabling features of federalism definitely lay good foundations for a broader and better integration of democracy into a state. Besides that, federalism is a successful and democratic way to solve conflicts in multicultural states. But it is not a panacea as it is thought to be today, especially in conflict areas where everybody is calling for federalism to overcome uh, the well-known conflicts. In an overall assessment, violations of a strict majority rule and the criticism of executive federalism are for me of less significance, particularly be, uh, because the deficit of executive federalism can be mostly overcome by applying the right measures and corrections. In many federal states, federalism and democracy go hand in hand, supporting and complementing each other. Thank you. <laughs>